Since this show started taking off, I've received an enormous amount of requests for movies I should tear into. Surprisingly, I don't very often get multiple requests for the same movie. So when I do, I tend to take notice. It happened with Aragon, which I tore into last year, and it happened recently with the movie I'm tackling today. Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. The film is based on Rick Riordan's critically acclaimed novel, The Lightning Thief, the first book in a series of five, which follows the story of a young boy named Percy Jackson who discovers he is the son of Poseidon, the ancient Greek god of the sea. When Zeus' weapon, the Thunderbolt, is stolen right out from under him, Percy quickly becomes a suspect and he has to set out on a quest to find the stolen weapon and clear his name, running into several mythological gods and monsters along the way. At first, I wasn't really sure why I was getting so many requests for this one. With Aragon, it was obvious. That movie was terrible from start to finish. Percy Jackson, on the other hand, well, it was just a mediocre action movie. It wasn't great, and it certainly made many missteps, but I didn't find it especially bad either. Then I read the book. I get it now. Boy, do I get it now. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting the movie sucks purely because it's not completely faithful to the book. Movie adaptations rarely are 100% true to the source material, and this is often out of necessity rather than incompetence. What works in a book doesn't always work in a movie, and vice versa. But while the movie version of The Lightning Thief more or less follows the basic story of the book and has most of the same characters, the people behind the film made several changes from the source material, seemingly for no other reason than because they could. For example, in the book, the classic gods and goddesses of Greek mythology are very much real, though they generally like to keep a low profile. Whenever they do have to take care of business in the mortal realm, they have a special type of magic that allows them to disguise themselves and their actions so the humans are none the wiser. So how does the movie begin? With a 20-foot tall Poseidon casually strolling out of the Atlantic Ocean, trident in hand, in plain view of a late-night fisherman, who is no doubt in need of a clean pair of pants, Granted, exposing yourself to one old man in the middle of the night isn't nearly as bad as strolling through Times Square during rush hour. Still, he has the ability to disguise himself as a normal human, which he does a second later using what I will admit is a pretty cool effect, so why have him unnecessarily risk detection just so we can say, hee hee hee, he scared an old man. Anyway, Poseidon, played by Kevin McKidd, makes his way to the observation deck of the Empire State Building, where Zeus, played by Sean Bean, is waiting for him. Wait a minute. Greek gods at the Empire State Building. I have been willful. I have been disobedient. Mighty Zeus has more wisdom than Hercules. He knew better what is best for him. Nah, it's probably just a coincidence. Zeus. Poseidon. It's been many years. It's been many years? How is that possible? According to the book, you and the rest of the 12 Olympians meet up once a year during the winter solstice, and the movie takes place in June. It's been less than six months. I promise I'm not going to nitpick every single minute detail that they changed, because if I do, we'll be here all day. But so far we have seen two major, and might I add, pointless changes to the gods' behavior, and we haven't even hit the opening titles yet. Zeus mentions his thunderbolt has been stolen and suggests Poseidon may have had a hand in it. Due to ancient rules, a god cannot directly steal from another god, so Poseidon can't have taken it directly. Zeus, however, suspects Poseidon's son may be doing his father's dirty work for him, even though Poseidon insists he hasn't even seen his son since he was a baby. He must return the bolt to me in 14 days, by midnight on the summer solstice. Or there will be war. Um, the door wasn't locked. You could have just... You know. The next day, we meet Percy Jackson, played by Logan Lerman, who is sitting at the bottom of a swimming pool trying to hold his breath until the end of the opening credits. He eventually surfaces to applause from his handy-capable friend, Grover, played by Brandon T. Jackson who was playing a high schooler even though he was 25 at the time of this movie's release. Then again, the book does describe him as looking like he was held back a few years, so I guess it works. Then we move ahead to English class while Logic continues to trail behind. Good morning. I'm Miss Dodds, your substitute English teacher. Would someone please explain what Shakespeare was trying to convey in this line from Othello? Percy Jackson? 
You just introduced yourself as a substitute teacher, and yet you already know Percy's name. You think an English teacher would know something about plot holes. At this point, we get a little taste of how rough Percy's life is. For starters, he suffers from ADHD and dyslexia, which naturally doesn't make life at school very easy. And his home life isn't much better. While he does have a good, loving mother, played by Catherine Keener, he also has a certified grade-A douchebag of a stepfather, played by Joe Pantoliano. Where's my beer? It's in the fridge. So what, it's supposed to magically float from the icebox and into my hand? No, you're supposed to magically float your ass two steps to the left and get it your damn self. This character's name is Gabe Ugliano. Yes, really. Ugliano. And I can't fault the movie for this because this comes straight from the book. Rick, I know your story was intended for a younger audience, but that's still pretty corny. Why do you stay with that pig? He smells like a sewer. I'm right around the corner, you little shit. I can still hear you. The next day, Percy's class takes a trip to the museum, where they're shown an exhibit on the classic Greek gods by Mr. Brunner, played by Pierce Brosnan. Here, Percy discovers that while he has trouble reading English due to his dyslexia, he can read ancient Greek just fine. Isn't that interesting? At some point, Miss Dodds asks if she can talk to Percy alone. After walking into the next room... Where is it? Whoa, whoa, hey, hey. How did you get up there? <laughs> whoa, whoa! That's probably how a lot of kids see their English teachers. The Beast, formerly known as Miss Dodds, demands Percy hand over the lightning bolt, but of course he has no idea what she's talking about. Grover and Mr. Brunner hear the disturbance and burst into the room, and the wheelchair-bound man demands the Beast let Percy go or he will destroy her. Much to Percy's surprise, she sees this as a legitimate threat and leaves. Brunner and Grover quickly decide they need to get Percy to safety, and Brunner gives Percy what he claims is a powerful weapon. This is a pen. This is a pen. Well, the pen is mightier than the sword. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it was too easy, come on. Actually, in this case, the pen is not mightier than the sword. The pen actually is a magical sword. But Mr. Brunner doesn't actually bother to show Percy this, because that would just be silly. No, it's much more sensible to let Percy think you're just a crazy old man. In case you're wondering, yes, the book handles this scene much better. The two friends quickly head to Percy's apartment as Grover explains that he's supposed to be Percy's protector, which naturally makes Percy even more confused. After grabbing Percy's mom and nailing Gabe in the balls for good measure, they grab Gabe's car and start heading to a place they simply refer to as the camp. But just before they arrive, they are cut off by a minotaur who throws a cow at the car. You heard me correct. He throws a cow. Awesome. They scramble out of the car, and Grover loses his pants in the process. Turns out he's actually a satyr. Disguised as a boy with gimpy legs. Hang on. A gimpy-legged man who's really a satyr in disguise? This is getting weird. They reach the entrance to the camp, but a force field prevents Percy's mother from entering because she's human, and the Minotaur captures her. Following Grover's instructions, Percy pulls out the pen and clicks it. Unfortunately, before he can save his mother, she disappears into thin air. But Percy ain't about to run away without getting some, so he attacks the Minotaur and actually manages to slay the beast, though he does so with the Minotaur's broken horn and not his sword. In fact, he only swings the sword twice before it's knocked out of his hand, which makes its presence in this scene kind of pointless. Granted, stabbing it with the horn is how he killed the Minotaur in the book. Then again, in the book, he didn't have the sword at the time, so it made a bit more sense. Percy passes out after the fight and wakes up three days later in the camp's infirmary. I guess fighting a giant man-cow takes a lot out of you. At first, he assumes what happened must have been a dream, but the sight of Grover's goat legs tells him otherwise. Grover gets Percy out of bed and gives him a quick tour of Camp Half-Blood. Half meaning what? I think you know. Half meaning half mortal, half guy. Fire! Oh, guys, watch the arrows. Newcomer, hello. Newcomer or not, I should hope the two of you would be smart enough to not wander blindly into the middle of a shooting range. This is one of the more facepalm-worthy moments in the film. And it may seem like I'm really nitpicking by calling it out, but how stupid do you have to be to see a row of archers with raised arrows and walk directly in front of them? I'm sure they meant to play this for comedy, but it's really not that funny, and it makes Percy and Grover, two of the film's heroes, look like complete imbeciles. No. 
Anyway, Grover explains that Percy is in fact a demigod, and his dyslexia and ADHD have something to do with this. He has trouble reading English because his brain is hardwired for ancient Greek, as we saw in the museum, and he has trouble staying still due to his instinctive battle reflexes, which helped him in the fight with the Minotaur. Camp Half-Blood is a safe haven for demigods as well as a place for them to train. During the tour, Percy gets a brief look at Annabeth, daughter of Athena, played by Alexandra Daddario, who will become much more important later. He is also reintroduced to Mr. Brunner, or rather, Chiron, who has transformed from a wheelchair-bound man into a centaur. If you read the novel, you should recall the camp was run by two people, Chiron and the god Dionysus. He is technically in the film, but he doesn't show up until the very end, and his presence is never acknowledged. It's really too bad, as he was a great character. While Grover heads off to party with the daughters of Aphrodite, Chiron brings Percy to the home his father crafted for him. My father's Poseidon. God of the seas. This is a huge deviation from the book, and in my opinion, not for the better. When Percy arrived at Camp Half-Blood, they knew his father was a god, but that's all they knew. It took them a while to figure out his father was the sea god, and when they did, it was a big deal. According to the original story, World War II was essentially a battle with the sons of Zeus and Poseidon on one side, and the sons of Hades on the other. After the war, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, otherwise known as the Big Three, made a pact not to father any more children since they were far too powerful. Those of you who know your mythology will likely not be surprised to hear that Zeus fell off the wagon pretty quick, and eventually so did Poseidon. Hades greatly resented his brother's lack of willpower and would often send his monsters into the world to torment his nieces and nephews. Because children of the Big Three were extremely rare and powerful, and constantly in danger because of Hades, when Percy's parentage was discovered, it scared the shit out of nearly everyone at the camp and made him something of an outcast. But in the film, everyone at Camp Half-Blood already knows Percy is the son of Poseidon, and it's no big deal. Yes, Chiron does acknowledge children of the Big Three are rare, but it's really just a throwaway line and doesn't feel nearly as important. This is one of the movie's biggest mistakes, as it seriously undervalues the character, and I'm really not sure why they went this route. Chiron also takes this time to explain to Percy why on Earth his mother married Gabe, and this part actually is true to the book. Percy's mother put up with Gabe for all those years for Percy's protection. Apparently, Gabe is so much of an asshole that he gives off the biggest and smelliest of auras, which helped mask Percy's scent from the servants of Hades and kept him well hidden. That's actually kind of funny. Since Zeus thinks Percy is the lightning thief, Chiron wants to send him to Olympus to plead his innocence. But if he wants to make it there alive, he first has to learn how to fight. And apparently the best way to teach him is to throw him into a game of capture the flag with the other demigods, who are all well-trained and armed with swords. I hope they're saving his spot in the infirmary. Percy is placed on the blue team and introduced to Luke, played by Jake Abel. Son of Hermes and camp leader. Not necessarily in that order. So the games begin, and Percy discovers that he can actually hold his own in a sword fight despite having no formal training. He eventually reaches the enemy flag, but finds Annabeth guarding it, and she gives him a damn good ass whooping. But after getting his clock cleaned, Percy hears a voice in his head. Go to the water. Get to the water. After being rejuvenated by the water, Percy easily dispatches several members of the red team, including Annabeth, and claims the flag for the blue team. And I'm sure people who have read the book are screaming bloody murder right now since this is another huge deviation. For starters, Annabeth and Percy were on the same team. Second, Percy was not on offense. He stayed behind to guard his own team's flag. While playing defense, he was ambushed by several children of Ares, including a girl named Clarice who had pretty much had it out for Percy since he arrived. Thanks to the power he drew from the water, he was able to hold them off long enough for Luke to capture the flag and score the win for his team. This was also the point where they figured out Percy was the son of Poseidon. To be fair, I can kind of understand why the filmmakers wanted to change this up a bit. All things considered, the character Clarice wasn't very important to the story, although I've heard she plays a bigger role later on in the series. And putting Annabeth in her place to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Percy isn't totally out of left field, since their divine parents are Poseidon and Athena, who don't especially like each other. Making Percy the hero of the game, however, seems unnecessary. In one fell swoop, we've gone from undervaluing the character to over-glorifying him. Even though the story has to be heavily condensed for the film, I see no reason why he has to go from the new kid in town to the hero of Camp Half-Blood in just a few short minutes. That evening, everyone seems to be happy and content during supper until Hades emerges from the campfire and starts blowing shit up left and right. 
I guess he wasn't invited to the party and didn't take it well. Actually, Hades has come to tell Percy that he has his mother in the underworld, and if he ever wants to see her again, he will bring him the lightning bolt. Percy wants to go after Hades, but Chiron tells him to stick with the original plan. Naturally, Percy promptly disobeys Chiron's order and sneaks out of the camp. Grover spots him on his way out and joins in on the quest since he's supposed to be Percy's protector. And Annabeth joins the party as well because she's sick of training all the time and wants to actually do something important for once. You know, I really have to wonder if they even read the book or just skimmed through the Cliff's Notes. Once again, we have a major change. In the book, Chiron suspected Hades might be responsible for the theft of the lightning bolts, but the movie discards this idea immediately. Also, Percy didn't have to sneak out of camp in the middle of the night as he was given a quest to search for the bolt and return it to Zeus. He, Grover, and Annabeth left with Chiron's blessing. Does this change add anything to the story? Well... No, not really. Percy is disobeying a direct order from Chiron and taking a much more dangerous route that he is completely unprepared for, which doesn't make him look too bright. Hell, the movie even acknowledges that our heroes have no idea what they're doing. So, who knows how to get to the underworld? Did not think of that one. It never occurred to you that you might have to know where you're going in order to get there? <sighs> our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. They decide to ask Luke for help since his father is one of the few who has been able to enter and leave the underworld. And check out the setup Luke has in his cabin. I'm not sure how he's able to afford these numerous TVs and computers, but Hermes is the patron of thieves, so I'm guessing he stole them. Speaking of which, Luke says he never met his dad and doesn't know how to enter the underworld, but he did once break into his dad's house and stole some flying shoes, which he offers to Percy. He also provides a shield and a magical map that shows the location of three of Persephone's pearls, which will allow them to leave the underworld should they find a way in. I guess Hermes is also the patron of plot convenience. One bus ride later, they arrive at their first stop, Auntie M's Garden Emporium, which apparently specializes in statues. No one appears to be home, but they do find a fountain loaded with golden drachmas and take a few for the road. Hail patron of plot convenience! They split up to look for the first stone, and Annabeth finds a hysterical woman begging for help. Grover, meanwhile, finds a statue that looks just like his uncle. It's not my uncle Ferdinand, because my uncle Ferdinand was killed by... Medusa. <gasps> Percy! Grover manages to find Percy and warn him, and the two race to find Annabeth. Unfortunately, Medusa, played by Uma Thurman, finds her first. You have such beautiful hair. I once had hair like that. It looks like you still do. Oops. If you know your mythology, or if you've at least seen Clash of the Titans, and if you've seen the remake, I'm sorry, you're probably wondering why Medusa is here since she was killed by Perseus. Well, according to the book, monsters are never truly killed. If you're lucky, you can banish them to the underworld for a lifetime or so, but like a horror movie villain, they always come back. Sure would be nice if the movie had explained this, but apparently that's asking too much. The hysterical woman is turned into stone, which traps Annabeth in her grasp. But Percy manages to distract her long enough for Grover to break the stone woman's arm. And then Annabeth just casually tosses the hand aside. The hand itself was never broken, just the arm, which means she could have freed herself any time she wanted to. Annabeth, you're the daughter of the goddess of wisdom. Act like it. Percy is eventually captured by Medusa, but Annabeth and Grover save him by driving a truck through a wall. How they got this truck, I have no idea. This distraction allows Percy to sneak up behind Medusa, and it's off with her head. Heads up. Yeah. Stick around. They bag the head, and they find the pearl on Medusa's bracelet. With one MacGuffin down, they check the magical map of plot convenience, which tells them the next pearl is at the Parthenon in Nashville. I can't really compare this part of the film to the book since the trip to Nashville, as well as the hunt for the Three Pearls, only exists in the movie. But a replica of the Parthenon does fit the theme. They find the pearl pretty quickly atop the statue of Athena, but they can't get it with all the tourists around, so they sneak in at night and tranquilize the janitorial staff. Then Percy puts on the flying shoes, and this I can compare to the book. Luke did give Percy the shoes in the original story, but Chiron advised him not to wear them. The sky was Zeus's domain, and Percy was on Zeus's hit list at the time, so flying would be incredibly dangerous. So Percy gave the shoes to Grover, who did use them quite a bit, including the fight with Medusa. But the movie tosses all that right out the window. Percy grabs the pearl without too much trouble, but the janitors wake up and combine to form Devastator. I mean, a Hydra. 
and this Hydra can breathe fire, though I'm pretty sure the Hydra from Greek mythology could not. After a lengthy battle where Percy foolishly cuts off the Hydra's heads, resulting in two growing back, Grover whips out Medusa's head and turns the beast to stone. The tourists that show up tomorrow morning are in for one hell of a surprise. The third and final pearl is located at the fictional Lotus Casino in Las Vegas. After walking in, they are offered lotus flowers by a trio of waitresses who describe it as the casino's signature dish. Since it's free, our heroes decide there's no harm in taking a bite. Oh god, you're being sucked into a Lady Gaga music video! Run! Run for your lives! Sadly, they do not take my advice and decide to stay at the casino for a while, completely forgetting their mission. After a casino montage, which for some reason involves Grover getting his hooves painted, I guess he's a transvestite satyr, Percy hears Poseidon's voice in his head telling him not to eat the flowers. Gee, maybe you should have warned him before he ate the flowers, or does that make too much sense? After wandering around and meeting someone who is under the impression that the current year is 1971, Percy realizes the flowers are putting everyone in some kind of trance that makes them never want to leave. He quickly grabs Annabeth and Grover and manages to snap them out of it. The hotel staff realize they've woken up and try to stop them, which did not happen in the book, but it does make sense in the context of the story. Percy spots the pearl on a roulette wheel and swipes it, and they steal their second car and flee the casino. Grand Theft Auto, truly the mark of a great hero. They consult their magical map of plot convenience one more time to find the entrance to the underworld, and it directs them to the Hollywood sign in California. On the sign, they find some Greek graffiti, and when Percy reads it aloud, a doorway appears. This is a minor deviation from the book, but it's not so bad considering what's coming up. They enter the door and, true to the old stories, find the ferryman Charon standing by the river Styx. After handing him some of the drachmas they picked up earlier, he takes them to a place that looks much more like the Christian hell rather than the ancient Greek underworld. Yes, damned souls did end up in the underworld, but so did virtuous and neutral souls, and they were all punished or rewarded accordingly. It wasn't all fire, brimstone, and torture. This is not the underworld. This is hell. In fact, when our heroes are greeted by Persephone, played by Rosario Dawson, she flat out says this. Don't ignore me. Or what? What will you do? I'm already in hell. And speaking of Persephone, if you know the myth, you're probably wondering what the hell she's doing here. However, if you've read the book The Lightning Thief, you're probably wondering what the hell she's doing here. If you don't know the myth, Google is your friend, but here's the short version. Persephone, daughter of Demeter, was a goddess of nature who was abducted by Hades. She was eventually released and returned to her mother, but was forced to spend a few months of every year with him in the underworld. This coincides with the changing of the seasons. She returns to Earth in the spring and leaves after the harvest. Since this movie takes place in June, she should not be there. And in the book, she wasn't. Persephone brings the trio before Hades, played by Tony Iommi, I mean Steve Coogan, and Percy is at last reunited with his mother. But suddenly, Hades notices something hidden away in the shield Luke gave to Percy. Turns out Luke was the lightning thief all along. Since Hades has what he wants, he decides to cast Percy and company into the fires of hell. But Persephone grabs the bolt and zaps the shit out of him. Why'd you do that? Because he's cruel and abusive. The only thing I look forward to is my allotted time away from this hellhole. This is your allotted time, you dumb bitch. Do you not own a calendar? Percy decides it's time to leave, but he only has three pearls, which means someone will have to be left behind. In the book, although Annabeth and Grover both volunteered to stay, Percy chose to leave his mother behind because he knew he had to return the bolt to Olympus, and he'd need the help of Annabeth and Grover to do so. And he knew his mother would be pissed if he chose saving her over stopping World War III. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. But the movie throws that logic right out the window and has Grover stay behind. Why? Because the black dude always dies? I don't know. I really don't get why they made this change. If that was my mother, I'd want to save her too. But like Percy's mother, I'm pretty sure she'd kick my ass if I chose saving her over the world. Anyway, they smash their pearls and are transported to the roof of the Empire State Building. They're about to enter Olympus, but Luke the Lightning Thief shows up to stop them. And why did Luke steal the bolt? Well, in the book, he wasn't in on this alone. 
Long story short, he stole the bolt on behalf of Ares, the god of war. But both of them were being manipulated by Cronus, the titan who ruled Olympus until he was overthrown by Zeus and imprisoned in Tartarus. But like Dionysus, Ares is only featured in a brief cameo near the end of the film and never acknowledged. And Cronus is never mentioned at all. So what's Luke's motivation in the movie? Basically, he's just a power-hungry asshole with daddy issues. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm not sure what possessed them to think this would be more interesting than the original story. Hell, it's not really interesting at all. And I hear Cronus plays a role in the rest of the series, so I'm not sure how they'll rectify this in future movies. And they are at least making one more film, by the way. Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters is currently in production. Anyway, a battle ensues as Percy and Luke take to the air and crash through a conveniently empty building, and it ends when Percy unleashes a tidal wave upon Luke using several nearby water towers. <laughs> So they take the magic elevator to Olympus and return the bolt to Zeus, who calls off the war and, as a thank you, agrees to free Grover from the underworld. Percy has a heart-to-heart -heart with his father, Annabeth says a quick hello to mom, and they all return to Camp Half-Blood where they are once again free to wander aimlessly into shooting ranges. The end. So that was Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. Like I said, I get it now. When compared to the book, it's no contest. The book is the superior version of the story. So many details were changed in the movie, and in most cases, it did more harm than good. This is especially true of the Underworld section. Almost everything about that part of the film was wrong, and I'm blown away by the fact that Cronus, the main villain from the novel, was not in the film at all. Instead, all we got was a butthurt 20-something douchebag who wants to destroy Olympus because Daddy didn't hug him enough. Bullshit. If we ignore the source material and judge the story on its own merits, it holds up a little better, but it's still not terribly exciting. The heroes are still kinda stupid, the villain is still shit, and the magical map of plot convenience just reeks of lazy writing. It feels a bit like a low-rent version of some of Chris Columbus' previous work. But it wasn't all bad. The special effects were pretty good, especially the characters with non-human lower halves, and the fight scenes weren't half bad either. As far as casting goes, with the adult characters, they really went all out. There were a lot of big names in the film, and they all did an outstanding job. As far as the younger characters go, Columbus took a different route and cast relatively unknown actors. He also chose to deviate from the novel yet again by making Percy, Annabeth, Grover, and Luke a few years older, though the relative age difference between them is still about the same. Columbus said in an interview that he made this change because he didn't feel younger actors would have the necessary emotional range to play the characters properly. As his prior experience with child actors comes from Harry Potter, I do understand where he's coming from. The kids from the early Potter films, while certainly far from terrible, weren't the greatest actors on the planet either, though they did get much better with age. However, if he wanted actors who could emote properly, why did he cast Jake Abel as Luke? I confess I haven't seen any of his other work, but in this film he had the emotional range of a broomstick. Logan Lerman and Brandon T. Jackson were both great, and Alexandra Daddario was okay, but Abel looked and sounded like he was sleepwalking through the film. Probably not the best casting choice, Chris. In the end, even though it wasn't terribly popular among critics or the general public, it apparently made enough money to warrant a sequel, which is due out next year. It will have new writers and a new director, and hopefully they will learn from the mistakes of their predecessors. Join me next time when we will take another glorious look at the film career of Mr. Hulk Hogan. Until then, I'm the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Percy is disobeying a direct order from Chiron and taking a much more dangerous route that he is completely unprepared for. And it makes him look a little bit, uh... I fucked up the line. Because I'm a little bit, uh... <sighs>